So let's welcome Montgomery Blair High School Team 7138. So welcome. The first question will be the easiest. We'd like you to tell us your name and what year you are at, at school. I'm Ishan, I'm a junior. I'm Victoria, I'm a senior. I'm Raymond, I'm a senior. I'm Ethan, I'm a senior. I'm Jamie and I'm a junior. Um, we'll introduce ourselves. Um, your judges will be, I'm Karen Bliss from Virginia Military Institute. This is Dan Connors from IBM and Ben Galuso from Shippensburg University. You'll have 15 minutes for your presentation and I'll let you know, I'll signal you when you've got two minutes remaining. Um, and then after that, we'll have about five minutes of questions and then you'll be done. You may begin. Today we are here to discuss the lion's car share of the business. The two most prevalent means of daily transportation today in the United States are privately owned vehicles and public transportation of various forms. In the past few years, however, parking hassles, congestion, and rising costs have deterred many people from owning private vehicles, and public transportation, while adequate for heavily urbanized areas, certainly is not sufficient and cannot feasibly be entirely sufficient for suburban areas. Ride-sharing essentially fills in the gaps left behind by these increasingly problematic conventional modes of transportation, a trend which points to the prospect of a ride-sharing revolution. The overarching objective of our model is to analyze the opportunities for and viability of various ride-sharing business models. We begin by forecasting the evolution of certain cohorts of American drivers into the forthcoming years. While the problem statement did not explicitly instruct us to do so, we felt that analyzing the market available to ride-sharing companies on a macroscopic scale is a crucial first step to analyzing more geographically specific ride-sharing business models. The managerial objective of a ride-sharing enterprise will be to distribute costs over as large a customer base as possible, or in other words, minimize total costs divided by, the, by demand, average total costs. With that motivation, we assess the strength of the various business models by calculating the total incurred costs and predicting city-specific demand for that model. We then adjusted our assessments to account for a reduction in costs which will ensue from the introduction of autonomous, self-driving electric vehicles. We begin by analyzing who's driving. The first component of determining who's driving involved partitioning the population of American drivers into nine categories, which were obtained from crossing three classifications of time spent driving with three classifications of distance driven. Our partitioning algorithm revolved around dividing people by, met by metropolitan statistical areas, or MSAs, which are then further classified by population. We ultimately obtained time spent driving and distance driven on an individualized basis and then determined and fixed low, medium, and high distance and time ranges based off percentile rankings of those individuals in 2001. In these pie charts, the first letter indicates distance and the second indicates time. Upon creating these population distributions, we noticed significant trends between the 2001 and 2009 populations, which was, which was a motivation behind our ensuing iterative model of populations between the nine categories, or cohorts. In order to accomplish this, we originally intended to create a stochastic model, but that would have, that would have involved a nine by nine, matrix, nine by nine matrix with 81 unknowns, and that was simply not feasible. So instead, we generated matrices in which rows represented distance categories and columns represented time categories. The uppermost right entry would thus represent low distance and high time. We then found a matrix A which satisfies the uppermost equation on the slide and essentially uses matrix A to model population migrations between the categories. Here's a graph of the evolution of the driver cohorts normalized to the total population of American drivers. The purple trend reflects low time and distance, the blue trend reflects medium time and distance, and the gray-brown trend reflects high time and distance. These are the three most significant categories which makes intuitive sense as time spent driving is highly correlated to distance driven. The fairly incredible conclusion here, however, is that the percentage of Americans who are exhibiting low and medium dependencies on their personal vehicles is increasing at the compromise of Americans who are exhibiting a high dependence. In other words, Americans are depending less and less on their personal vehicles, but as transportation needs are likely not substantially changing, 
these Americans are turning towards other modes of transportation, a trend which reveals that there will be an enormous segment of customers for ride-sharing companies to target in the near future. Victoria will now discuss the next portion of her model. So next we dis discuss the viability of different car sharing business models in different cities. We consider the four business models of round trip car sharing, one way car sharing, the floating model, and the station model of one way car sharing, as well as fractional ownership. Our motivation for, doing such a, for creating such a model is that profits for a particular car sharing model are dependent on properties of a city. And these factors matter differently for each car sharing model, so that some car sharing models will be more successful in certain cities. Additionally, different models have different costs of implementation, which should act as a deterrent um, compared to the desirability of a particular model, which, is, which has a positive impact on the total viability of a car sharing model. We consider fractional ownership separately from the other three models because the factors that govern the fractional ownership model are vastly different from the factors that govern the other three. In fractional ownership, we assume that a car is shared between four people under optimal circumstances and that costs are split four ways. We additionally assume that this model is extremely desirable half of the time and minim minimally desirable the other half of the time, as an owner is already familiar with the car, which is a plus, but also there are often conflicts in scheduling and logistics and possible emergencies, which make it quite inconvenient. For the other three models, we narrowed down our significant, significant variables to walkability, population density, millennial percentage, and median income. Walkability is important because the more walkable a city is, the less likely residents are to own a car as they are able to walk to nearby amenities and would not need to own a car, opening a gap for the car sharing industry to take advantage of. Similarly, population density is very important as a high density implies that parking is both scarce and expensive which means residents, again, will not be likely to own a car and will more, more likely participate in car sharing. The percentage of millennials is also very important to our model as they are the target audience for the car sharing industry. And car sharing tends to do very well on college campuses. Finally, we have median income because residents with a very low income are very likely to walk or take public transportation, while residents with a very high income are more likely to own a private car. So our target audience would be residents with a median income, medium income, who would be likely to partic participate in car sharing. Next, we have Raymond to discuss the details of our data collection and the model. Once we had determined the significant variables for our desirability model, we collected data from, for the desirability and for each of our significant variables in a set of American cities to allow us to generate equations to calculate desirability in, for each car sharing model in any given city. In order to collect desirability data, we, we selected a representative company for each car sharing model and selected a desirability metric for each. For the round trip car sharing model, Zipcar was a representative company, and the approximate number of cars in a given city was a desirability metric. In the one-way floating model, we selected Turo as a representative and used the number of cars available in each city during a set period of time constant across all cities as our metric. For the one-way station model, Hertz was a representative, and we used the number of drop-off and pickup points in a given city to get our desirability. To collect data for significant variables, we use mostly US Census data. Once we'd collected our data, we used multiple linear regression to generate models for e uh, desirability models for each of our car sharing models. For each of these equations, we selected a combination of variables that would generate a regression equation that would give us the best adjusted R squared value. In addition, once we had created these regression equations, we standardized these, the coefficients using Chicago's results so that we could compare between models. This table contains our coefficients for each of, for the regression equations for each of our car sharing models after that standardization. Note that the positive and negative correlations represented by the, the positive, positivity or negativity of each of the coefficients 
generally corresponds with our earlier analysis when we talked about the significant variables. Once we had developed a desirability model, we now had to find the cost, we had to find a way to calculate the cost that a company would incur using each car sharing model. In order to do this, we first established a constant for per trip taken. In this, in this constant, we incorporated the initial cost of the car in addition to gas and car maintenance costs. The, this expression here gives the constant that we use. In addition, since there are unique factors that affect how much everything costs in a city, that depend on unique factors in each city, we took this, these natural differences into account by multiplying this constant by the cost of living index. In addition, for the one-way floating model, there's an additional labor cost as incurred by the jockeys that are needed. So we added in the cost of labor to our, to our cost uh, e equation when doing the one-way floating model. Ethan will now discuss the results from this model. Okay, so once we have a model for desirability and we have a model for cost, we somehow need to combine those to get profitability. So first we write that demand is desire times population. And this makes sense if you think of desire as sort of a probability of a given person using a car service. So a bigger population is a bigger market and we're gonna get more users and more profitability. We then divide this by cost, which essentially gives the demand a company generates per dollar that they spend and this allows them to choose how much profit they want to make on each dollar they spend. And then below those, you can see two bar graphs which show our results. On the left, we have the best city for each model, and the right, our best model for each city. And a few things to notice. First, Riverside Model 3, which is the one-way station model, was our best city model combination. So that would be our number one recommendation. Additionally, Poughkeepsie does very poorly in all of the models, and this is largely due to its small population, only 30,000, while all the others are at least 100,000. If we look more specifically at this table of the best city for each method, we see that Riverside is the best for all except round trip, for which Richmond is better. And some things about Riverside, it has the highest population density, the second highest walkability, and the highest population by over 100,000, all of which make it very attractive to car sharing. However, we also see that population, while it does factor in, is not overpowering, as Richmond is able to, able to overcome its lower population to be the best for round trip. And this is largely because Richmond has a high millennial percentage, which factors heavily into our round trip model. If we now look at the best method for each city, we see that one-way station is unanimously the best. And this may partially be due to how we constructed our model. When we were generating our regression equations, we used test data from slightly larger cities because it was more readily available. However, when we transitioned to apply the model to these smaller cities, there was one big difference, which was the median income was significantly lower. Since median income factors in negatively to the one-way station model, this gave these cities a slight boost. However, at the same time, it's not surprising that one-way station was the best. Hertz was our example for one-way station, and his, it has been around since 1918, a full 81 years before Zipcar was founded. And this is a model that's been proven time and, time and time again to be both profitable and sustainable. Now Jamie will introduce our last one. In order to extend our model into the future and take into account the introduction of autonomous electric vehicles, we had to make some slight modifications. The desirability co constants were kept um, constant because the, there would be no added convenience with the new technology, nor would there be any novelty to using the product because by that time, autonomous cars will have become commonplace in society. However, what did have to change was the cost model. The cost of gas and labor were set to zero, while the initial investment cost was increased due to the higher upfront vehicle costs for autonomous cars. However, we expect this increase to diminish over time after some techno technological breakthrough um, significantly decreases the cost of autonomous cars. By looking at data from the advent of the Macintosh computer, we decided that five years after this technological breakthrough, the cost of autonom autonomous cars would decrease 50% towards the equilibrium cost. Here you can see the model of the price of autonomous cars exponentially decaying, and you can see that it'll trend towards the equilibrium cost, which is equal to the constant we had before, 
minus the cost of gas, because gas is no longer taken into account. So our results were that the same cities did the best for each model. And this makes sense because the, the city of implementation affected the desirability much more than it affected the cost. And since the desirability was being held constant, the same cities did well. However, what did change is which, mo which like, model did best in each city. And th this is because the one-way floating model got an extra boost because the additional cost of labor was no longer added. And therefore, it did better in Knoxville and Riverside than the one-way station model. So our conclusions are that in the first section, we found that the, the percentage of the population, which is depending on their own individual car, is decreasing. And thus, in the future, we expect that the market for car sharing is going to increase. Secondly, we created a model which could be applied to any city given an easily available set of variables. We then applied that, to our, we then applied that model to our four cities, and we extended it into the future by seeing how the cost portion of the model would change with the advent, with the advent of autonomous cars. We would like to acknowledge the Moody's Foundation and the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics for this wonderful opportunity. We would also like to acknowledge our teachers, especially our coach, Mr. Rose, and the Blair Magnet Program. Thank you. Uh, OK, so I'd like to ask the first question. Um, and I want to back up to question number one. Could you expound on what are the actual categories that you used, and why and how did you choose them? Well, the categories that we used were those that were indicated in the problem. So I mean, we had to address low, medium, and high distance driven and low, medium, and high time spent driving. So we obtained the nine categories based off crossing those three factors. And then we essentially looked at how the population within those nine categories evolved over time. We also decided a low, medium, and high relatively. So it was relative to the other drivers. We didn't have an absolute metric for it. So when you say you didn't have a metric, can you, uh, so when I say that someone drives some medium amount of time? Right, so I mentioned that we obtained time spent driving and distance driven on an individualized basis. And then for essentially we took the top 33% for each of those categories and designated it high. We took the next 33, designated it medium and so on. Okay. And, and then, then yeah, over time we kept that same, that same like number from 2001 so that it's not always at 33% or high, it's at 33% were high in 2001, and that number is decreasing over time. Thank you. On the Markov chain uh, approach you used, did you uh, plug in 2016 and do sort of a sanity check to see if when you extended your model out to current time that it matched current data? Unfortunately, the data we used was very specific, and uh, it was very hard to find low, medium, and high uh, data for 2016 because it would need to be adjusted for our exact cutoffs. So how we actually got our data is from the National Highway Transportation Survey. We looked at their survey of around 300,000 people and looked at each person individually. And this was just not possible for 2016 because there was no survey and we could also not get a summary statistic. Yeah, um, so uh, once again, thank you for your talk um, and your paper. I have a question about, um, about model two, or, and so this will be right the zippity do or don't. Um, in that model, you have a lot of, you know, you use the regression models in order to um, come to your, identify your final model, and you also have some discussion, and you, as you did today as well, about the p-values and, and the r-squared values. Um, and, and just talking about how valid or how reasonable it was to use these things in your model. Can you, um, or can you describe the, or did you perform any sensitivity analysis, I guess, in, in doing this model to see how, how it behaved with, with different changes? Um, our model was a linear model, so mm -hmm. rather than doing a sensitive, sensitivity analysis, we can discuss the effect size of the coefficients. So um, we see a very small, or 
Actually, the effect size for income is not as small as it seems because income figures tend to be very large. Um, we also see that walkability does not affect uh, the predict the predicted does not affect the predicted desirability very much as the coefficient is very small. And with more time, we would have liked to perform a more in-depth analysis, but with the time allotted, we decided that effect sizes were sufficient. Okay. And actually, one uh, one follow-up on that would be based on based on the results of your analysis and getting these um, you know the the data you're able to find. Were there any other considerations that you thought? Oh, I wish you know. I wish I could add that factor in. Um, actually, we have a slide prepared. <laughs> <laughs> we do. Okay, so um, we did want to be able to have our factors change over time. Uh, unfortunately, there was not that much. Well, for the, the time allotted was not. There was also not as much data and not enough time allotted for us to do so. Um, are you? Are you also asking about other factors we would have considered in our model or like other models we would have considered? My question was more about other factors based on the, um, you identified that some of the factors were not as important to different models, right? Right. So would you have liked to have found something, uh, you know, maybe uh, you realized, oh, maybe we, we, it'd be nice to find some other um, measurable. Yeah. We actually spent a lot of time on the competition day trying to like figure out specific colleges in each city and like actual like college campuses and how that would affect things but we decided that was that was we wanted our model to be very easily applicable to any city we wanted and it was too hard to make that to make like college campuses applicable to any city because that's like there's t it's tedious to find that data so we decided to like scratch that instead use millennial percentage which we didn't think was quite as good but which was much more like reliable we, we also wanted to make the variables as independent as we could make them for the model, but obviously that's not entirely possible, but we, that was our goal. And we also wanted to consider as few variables as possible because we were looking at adjusted R squared values. Mm -hmm. Okay. One more question on the, the future roadmap. You zeroed out labor costs for the self-driving electric cars, and you zeroed out gasoline costs, right? Yeah. Did you factor in the cost of electricity? No, I did not. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. <laughs>